So in this chapter, chapter three, we're going to be going over evolution, biodiversity, and population and ecology from the essential environment textbook. So in this chapter, it starts out with a case study of um, the Hawaiian Islands, and they have a certain bird there, and I'll, I'll go to the bird first. It's the Akai bird, and there's 18 different species of it there, but it's been highly threatened because of a lot of things. Um, humans bringing in uh, non-native species that have brought fungus and have killed like the native trees that this bird lives on. Additionally, you have um, the introduction of things like um, the Hawaiian chickens that have like gotten loose and are, you know, all over certain of the Hawaiian islands and they will go and eat like native amphibians and, and reptiles and other birds eggs and they're, they really are all over the place <laughs> depending on what island you go to. Um, this is actually a video. Um, if you want to show this clip or look at it, it's called the International Buzz Surrounding Kauai's uh, chickens from KITV, but it kind of shows you just how many there are in a lot of places. But this bird, the Akai, is also threatened because of habitat loss, which is the biggest threat to most species. They just need a place to live. But here's a map showing the clear cutting and cutting down of forests on places like Maui uh, to make room for things like hotels, parking lot, entertainment, etc. Um, so it's something that we should be cognizant of. So a species specifically is an organism that can interbreed with other ones that are the same species and their offspring that they have can, can reproduce. So here's some of the cool, um, cool species that live in Hawaii. And I think this Happy, spa happy face spider is really awesome. So a species is grouped into a population where there's a whole little like group of those species living together and populations are grouped further into communities and it goes up the line. But first we're going to talk about evolution or how populations change. Now individuals don't evolve. An individual can't evolve. Like I'm a rather short person. I can't just will myself to be taller. Um, but populations over time can get taller or populations over time could get shorter. And since short genes are actually dominant over um, tall genes, it's, it's more likely that our population of humans is going to get shorter over time. Um, so evolution is driven by natural selection. Um, here is like a very classic example of the birch trees before and after the industrial revolution. So birch trees are naturally very white and there was a moth that the moth had the genes to be either dark or light. So when the birch trees were light, the light moths would go and land on them and hide pretty well during the day and birds would come and eat the darker moths, decreasing their gene pool. However, in the Industrial Revolution, when the trees were darker with soot, the black moths were easier, had an easier time hiding and the white moths were eaten more readily. So there was a whole gene shift there. Um, which altered the gene, um, the allele frequency in the gene pool. So how often that gene shows up in the gene pool, that is called an evolution. So a shift in the gene frequency will account for an evolution. So um, humans have worked to um, push to evolve different species to help us out, like for breeding um, different pet traits that we like or different crops, um, antibiotic resistance and livestock, pesticide resistance. These are all different ways that we work to selectively breed populations to get them to have the traits that we want. Um, populations can also um, have different mutations that cause changes in the gene pool over time and some mutations are good, bad, a lot are just very neutral and don't have an effect at all. So species are clumped in how closely related they are genetically and so there's different models that can be made that illustrate that. Just because two organisms have a similar body shape does not mean that they are related. For instance, this shark and this dolphin have very similar body traits, but they actually are not 
are not related at all. We're looking at a mammal as one, and a sh the shark is a fish. Dolphin is a mammal, and the shark's a fish. And they um, ha had to both overcome living in the water and how to move effectively so they have similar body plans, though they are not related. Um, so artificial selection, we already talked about it. It's like us breeding things on perfect purpose because those are the traits that we want. On the planet as a whole, there's been about 1.8 million species total that have been identified, but scientists think that there's minimally double that, if not up to 100 million species out there on the planet, and many of which we just don't know about yet. Allopatric speciation is a type of speciation where two organisms get divided in their space and that division over time um, ends up causing the gene pools just go in different directions until they get to a point where the two can no longer interbreed. That is called the allopatric speciation and um, it's just like the division of land that causes speciation. So um, scientists make these trees called phylogenic trees that show relatedness of other species and then they are clumped um, by having a single species and then above that some that are cl more closely related are called genus so it'll add a few, a few species together will fit in the genus and then above that is a family, an order, a class, a phylum, a kingdom, and then domain. So um, this shows how closely related things are and as I, you expand the bubble you include more criteria and so you include more individuals. Um, the fossil record gives us really good ideas of what was living in the past. For instance, I put these pictures here because it fits Southern California. And in Southern California, we had a giant mammoth that's so awesome. And it helped actually pollinate and fertilize our really cool Joshua trees that we have. And there's some evidence that Joshua trees are not doing as well anymore because now the sloths that helped like pollinate and move their seeds for them have gone extinct, but um, that's all like in the fossil record, but an animal that no longer exists. So it's, it's called extinct. So there's certain animals that are more vulnerable to extinction. Um, animals that are endemic to an area means that they are found in one place and nowhere else in the world. Another Southern California example is the Channel Island fox. It's a very cute little fox. It's found on our Channel Islands, Catalina and the Channel Islands, um, and nowhere else in the world, this little fox. And um, because it's endemic and not, it's very niche where it, it can only live, it's only lived there and nowhere else, it's more vulnerable to s extinction than something that is widespread over the whole planet. Um, so the earth has had different mass extinction events where 15 to 90% of, of the, um, living things have died all at once and scientists do estimate that we are on the verge of a sixth mass extinction. One of the reasons that they believe that is because we're altering um, habitats really quickly. Um, we're moving species around to places where they don't belong. So non-native species over hunting, pollution, and, and climate change. This um, is the country that I got to live and study in. Um, well, Malaysia, which is part of Borneo. Um, but you can see in this model, Borneo over time, in 1973, the forest cover until like present day, how much it reduces um, because of deforestation due to the palm oil um, fields that are being built out there, like harvested out there. Um, so ecology in our populations um, you will have an organism, a single organism, that can live with a group of the same species called a population. Further up the line, they can live in a community of multiple species living together, and that feeds into a full ecosystem where the living and non-living parts are working together, and that would be like the ocean in this one, this community, it would take into account like the ocean water, the currents, the salinity, etc., and the living things. So it's the living and non-living things. 
And then all of that together, multiple of those um, ecosystems um, feeds upward further to a biosphere. Um, and, and there's some intermediary steps along the way in case you've heard of other ones too, other steps, but ultimately it feeds up to a biosphere. So each organism has specific needs or a role that it plays in the environment that it lives. So this is a proboscis monkey that um, is a fun, fun animal from um, Borneo, where I got to study. Um, but they play a certain role in, in pollinating and, and in building habitats and in, in its whole um, ecosystem, where if this animal is removed, there is a gap now there. There are certain species that are very narrow, like um, the monarch butterflies in Southern California. They can only lay their eggs on milkweed. That's it. That's the only plant. And their babies eat that milkweed, and it's the only food source their babies can eat. And so because of that, they're called specialists because if the milkweed is gone, which it is largely in Southern California, and that's why we're seeing the monarch collapse, um, that and a few other reasons, but um, with the milkweed gone, the monarchs can't lay their eggs, they can't have babies. So that is called a specialist when they really only have one, like a very narrow niche. A raccoon, on the other hand, is an animal that it'll come in and just like be opportunistic and just take what it can where it can. And so it has a higher chance of surviving when there's more pressures there. Um, one um, thing that's important in populations is maintaining a population size that's okay for breeding. A lot of people don't know, but our California state bear was the California grizzly bear. A lot of people think it's just a grizzly bear. It's not. It was its own species that did go extinct. Um, it's thought that in Southern California, there was probably about 10,000 of these. They were a massive bear that could live about 20 years. Their shoulder was about five feet high, but they were about nine feet long. But if they stood up, they were close to like 12, 13 feet, which is crazy. They were over hunted until um, they got to I would recommend looking at a few articles on that because it's pretty sad, um, but it's an interesting thing that if you, you know, like California history, you might appreciate knowing. Um, so I put an article here, extinctanimals.org, California grizzly bear, but there's other cool things, information about it on like Wikipedia and things. Um, so populations and in maintaining healthy population sizes are really important and they distribute themselves in different ways like they spread out in different ways they can be completely random and each of the colors from these trees represent different trees so it's just totally random or they can be very uniform where every organism is like almost evenly spaced I, you see this a lot in like desert plants or plants or organisms can be very clumped and a lot of times this is around waterways or or a place where like a bunch of seeds from like a dandelion all landed in one spot so there'll be a little clump of them right there so there's different ways that populations can be spread out populations also have distinct sex ratios like the number of males to females interesting in the human population we have about 101 males born to every 100 females. Um, and so the sex ratio is kind of different depending on the animal and then age structure, like how long um, an organism lives. There's going to be some animals like um, fish that will lay a lot of eggs early on and not um, not very many of them will survive. Interesting, this is the California sheephead from our water and sheephead will actually have nearly all females and one male in an area, when that one male dies, um, the females will get together and they will have a large mouth contest where they'll open their mouths and flex and see who has the biggest mouth. And whoever has the biggest mouth will um, then turn into a male and, and will be the one male in that area. Um, so they will actually change. So they actually have the large majority are females with very few males um, and a male only coming about because of the, the death of another. Um, okay, so populations change over time. Natality is the birth of individuals in a population. Mortality is the death of individuals in a population. Immigration is individuals moving in and emigration is individual moving 
out. And so these populations change constantly based on these four factors. And there's a whole mathy equation to go with that, where you take the birth rate and subtract the death rate. And then you take the immigration rate, like how many are moving in minus emigration, how many are moving out. You add those together and then you can see if the population is growing or shrinking um, using that, that equation. So there's some factors that limit how much a population can grow and spread out over time. Um, this is a certain um, bird that was, um, we, we do have doves in our area, but this one specifically was invasive and brought here because it didn't have the normal predators. It, it grew exponentially. Um, however, normally with normal predators, um, populations will reach what's called a carrying capacity where there's only a certain amount of resources. Um, the, the environment can only hold a certain amount. There's disease or par parasites or predators that will keep the population at a maximum. Okay, so it will reach what is called a carrying capacity over over time. There's actually a really cool video on this from Kurgazat, um, the billion ant mega colony and the biggest war on earth. I recommend you watch it because it totally goes into this and also um, features a uh, California um, population of ants here in Southern California that we are being affected by this. Um, so density dependent factors that restrict population growth are those that um, like these people all being really close together, if there was some kind of disease, for instance, um, if they're all really close together, they have a really good chance of sharing that disease. That would be a density dependent factor because having more or a dense population is going to make it spread faster. Then there's also factors that you know, will limit population sites called density independent factors. So for instance, a massive heat wave doesn't care if there's a lot of people in that area or not a lot of people in the area, the heat wave is just going to come. It's not really, it won't really change or spread more or less because there's a lot of people are like this tornado. It's not going to arrive or not arrive because there's more or less people. It's just going to come when it does and affect who, you know, whoever is in its way. Um, so there's density dependent and density independent. And carrying capacities, how many individuals an area can support can change. If there's a massive wildfire in an area, then the area won't be able to carry as many individuals anymore. So the carrying capacity has been reduced. Um, all of this leads to why it's really important to conserve biodiversity because we don't know how it's affecting every single species. Um, one way that you can help with that besides planting like native species and making other efforts is to, when you go out in vacation, um, engage in ecotourism. That's like tourism where you go out and see um, wildlife. You go out and like do things out in um, different uh, wilderness spaces or in different lands where you contribute money to groups that are working to save and preserve these areas.